to give ourselves totally to you, Heavenly Father, to turn our whole heart over to you so that there's nothing that we're keeping hidden from you, God, and that uh, we can totally put our trust and our faith in you. Thank you for this new year. Thank you for uh, new life in you, Lord God. Give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Happy New Year to all of you, and uh, sorry I missed last Sunday. Um, many of you know Judy's mom went to be with the Lord last Sunday, and uh, Judy and her sisters and all of us were able to be with her. And in those moments, had her uh, memorial service yesterday, and uh, um, just can't wish her back. I know that uh, she's in a, a much better place than she was when she left here. And uh, as one of her nieces shared, shared with us, it uh, was kind of a, a good moment, a lot of memories that uh, were being shared. And uh, one of the nieces said, uh, a friend of hers had told her that uh, she had heard that uh, uh, in that moment when uh, somebody's leaving here, uh, that's uh, often the last words that are spoken, oh, I think she's gone. And then on the other side, somebody's saying, oh, here she comes. And uh, what a great moment and uh, reminder that is to us. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, New Year's. We're going to talk about actually what I was going to tell you last week. So uh, uh, we're going to uh, be talking a little bit about uh, just kind of looking back at uh, our lives a little bit. And uh, I think as uh, uh, Americans, we are, are definitely fascinated and uh, almost, I could almost use the word uh, infatuated with uh, time and uh, how we regulate it. And we have all sorts of gadgets to keep us on time. Uh, my uh, regular watch that uh, I don't even wear anymore had uh, an alarm on it. My, my uh, smartphone has an alarm on it. I have clocks at home that have alarms on it. Uh, even, my clocks are even self-setting now. I don't even have to worry about it at some place over in... Switzerland, I think, and Greenwich time, at, at the atomic clock just automatically changes every night magically for me in case it's lost a, a half a second during the day or something. And uh, so we, we have those, those sorts of things. We have uh, coffee makers that uh, we don't even have to get up and turn on anymore. We can just pre-program them. So in the morning, uh, we can wake up to the smell of the, the aroma coming to us and this uh, I haven't changed the coffee from the day before, and uh, that's not a good moment for, for my girl. But uh, uh, we have microwaves that allow us to cook, quote-unquote, a meal. <laughs> I've, never, I've never had a microwave meal that was really a meal, okay? But uh, we have those that uh, don't take hours. They can take seconds or minutes anymore. And uh, uh, even at Christmas time now, uh, if... You're like us, uh, have automatic timers even on the Christmas tree lights. So I don't even, I don't even have to get up. I just, I just have to go at about 4 in the afternoon. Magic. The lights come on. And then I go to bed at night, and at about 10 o'clock, magic. They all go off. And uh, I don't even have to worry about that. Well, time is precious, isn't it? Uh, it's the one thing that uh, we, can't, uh, we can't recover uh, as we go through our lives. And uh, what I'd like you to look at with me today is time. And I want to look at how we use time uh, in our lives. I love that God gives us brand new, day, brand new days, but a brand new year every 365 days, unless it's a leap year. But every 365 uh, days, we get to start all over again. And uh, I think God has that plan for us because he knows that uh, sometimes as we're going through life and uh, we've gone through our year and uh, we look back a little bit and we think, oh, man, I really blew it there. How many of you kept all of your New Year's resolutions from last year? 
Pastor Ryan. I'm so impressed. You know, that it's a good thing you've called him to be the senior man here because, uh, man, but, uh, uh, and you too? I just love this place. Oh, you didn't have any. Well, that explains it, see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I know my treadmill still makes a great coat hanger and uh, those sorts of things. But what I want to do today is, um, is look back at uh, our lives a little bit. And uh, I don't want to talk about necessarily what's behind us, uh, but I want to look at what's ahead of us. Uh, in our personal lives. The Apostle Paul reminds us that uh, it's good to look back, but it's also good to draw lines in the sand from time to time and then press on. He says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, uh, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. I love that, don't you? One thing I do, I forget what's behind, and uh, I strain toward what's ahead. And uh, that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about stopping today. As you look at the back of your bulletin uh, today, you can uh, see the outline there. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 20. Uh, Four through 34, and I'm going to read from the message version this morning, and then we're going to look at uh, this passage a little bit more in depth. God tells us through, uh, through Christ himself, you can't worship two gods at once. Loving one God, you'll end up hating the other. other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. If you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There's far more to your life than food, the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God. And you count far more to him than birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror even gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The ten best-dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside of them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, and do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting, so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. So steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all of your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your attention, entire attention, to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard times come up when the time comes. Well, let's look at uh, the outline here. I think too often we get uh, a little bit caught up in the American dream. We've just come through the American dream season, haven't we? Uh, Christmas time, and we want to get all those gifts and all of those uh, gadgets that I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, in fact, uh, a friend of mine uh, recently sent me a uh, a picture that uh, was the front page of a, a Christmas flyer, I think it was for uh, Radio Shack, uh, in 1995. And uh, every single item that was on there, uh, clocks and, and phones and all those sorts of things, are now on this item alone. It, it was just a shock. 
Uh, all, of the th- all the things you had to buy separately then are all in these sorts of things. So we see all of these things that come our way. And when it comes to time, sometimes we, we look at all of these gadgets and things. They're really adding to the quality of our lives. <laughs> yeah, we understand that that's not necessarily true, is it? Well, let's look at why that's not necessarily true. Let's look at stopping. I use the word stop today as an acronym. We're going to look at each of the letters. S stands for self-examination. Self-examination. This is where we need to start. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40 says this. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. I don't think there's a better time of the year, obviously, than uh, the first week of the new year to begin to examine ourselves. And uh, one of the things that uh, I realize is when I talk about self-examination, we seldom do it. We talk about doing it, uh, but we don't usually do it. You know, when I go to the uh, doctor's office, um, I just had my second cataract surgery last Wednesday, so I'm... Everything's very weird today. And uh, I can see you now without my glasses, but I can't see this now without glasses. So I have cheater glasses today that are really... Well, anyway. And, uh, but when I, when I go to the doctor, and I'm sure when you go to the doctor, uh, they want to know uh, things like this. How are you sleeping? Uh, the nurse always asks what? Do you feel safe at home? Well, of course I do. I'm married to Judy. <laughs> this is recorded, right? Yes. I'll get that, get that for her. Uh, uh, how are you eating? Uh, what, uh, what's uh, going on in your life? And, and then uh, as the doctor's examining me, uh, they're asking me all of these questions. What are, why are they asking those things? Well, they want to try to find out what's really going on. Okay, they're, they're looking in some of those questions to try to determine when you've come in with uh, headaches or something else that's going on. They're trying to determine what could possibly be the cause. Well, that's what we talk about when we're talking about self-examination. When uh, I'm talking about you needing to stop this week sometime along the line and, and look at yourselves, so what I want you to uh, be looking at is maybe uh, things like this. At, and when we look at this, sometimes we just look at negatives. That's not what I'm talking about. What you most enjoy this past year? What was one of those great moments uh, this uh, past year? What changes in your life brought you joy uh, this past year? One area uh, uh, certainly uh, for my family was uh, our, our new granddaughter that came in. We had her first uh, birthday celebration this past year, and uh, all of that and the joy that she's been bringing into our family uh, unit. Uh, just um, er- another area for me is a, a, a broken relationship that got repaired this year uh, that had been ongoing for a long time. Uh, those sorts of things. Uh, what are some things that uh, I hope to change but didn't uh, this past year? Well, I'm not going to tell you that. Because I did, yeah, I'm, yeah. We don't want to look at what did I hope to change and didn't do it. Uh, another question would be, how did I spend my time? How did you spend money this past year? How did you use your spiritual gifts? You know, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that God's Spirit gives us a gift, a spiritual gift. And I've, actually, I've never met any follower of Christ that hasn't been multiply gifted. But how have you used that gift? Uh, yesterday at uh, uh, my uh, mother-in-law's funeral, uh, the uh, uh, pastor's wife was our musician for the day, the Alliance pastor uh, in Garrison, Minnesota. And Carla has a gift of, of just exaltation as she sings. And uh, it was just one of those, as she sang, it was like, how did you use your gift this year or your gifts? Uh, how, how are you doing that? Who's closer to the kingdom of God this year as we come into this year than they were at the beginning of 2015? Uh, is there anybody that you know has come into the kingdom of God 
uh, because of your ministry to them uh, this past year. Those are the sorts of things that I'm talking about when we're, we're talking about self-examination. It's really just sitting down and looking at uh, our lives honestly. Why do we need to do that? Because life is so busy, isn't it? Uh, we, we get caught up in that, you know, when I get a little break here, I'm going to take time to do that. And what happens? There's never a break, okay? And one of the things that, that I've shared, especially with uh, my oldest grandson now, he's uh, turned 16 this past year and got his driver's license, and, and that's been a joyful thing to watch. But uh, one of the things that uh, I've, I've kind of talked to him a little bit is how he uses time. And one of the things that I realize is that um, he, he's pretty good with his time, but uh, I, I just encourage him to make sure that he knows what he's doing with this time because if he doesn't decide ahead of time what he's going to do with this time, guess what? I will for him. Or somebody will. Or something will. And so that's what I mean when we're talking about self-examination is just sitting down and, and looking at those things in your life and saying, how, how am I doing? How did I get healthier this year? How did I grow in my faith this year? What did I really do? The second thing, the T stands for thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. When we look again at Matthew chapter 6, uh, God reminds us of all the blessings that he pours out on us every day. Uh, he talks about the wildflowers there. Uh, my guess is that uh, for as I look out, and of course I don't know every situation in every home, but I'm guessing uh, all of us enjoyed a fairly good night's sleep last night. Uh, we were comfortable, our homes were heated, our apartment was heated. As you came here today, your car was heated. Uh, if, it's not, if it wasn't, uh, talk to a pastor, and uh, yeah, he can, he can help you out. No, but what I'm trying to say there is sometimes we, we forget just everyday things that we can be thankful for. Uh, as I was thinking of this this week, uh, I was thinking one of the things I'm most thankful for, uh, it, it, uh, we didn't have it for about 24 hours one day, is I can go to any faucet in my house and turn on clean water. And when you don't have it for a day, you just kind of notice. And, uh, and, I, and I love that. My guess is that as we look at this, as we begin to uh, go into 2016, don't forget to thank God for all that he's given you this past year. Even Judy's mom's home going. Uh, yesterday, as I listened to uh, uh, grandchildren and great-grandchildren and, and lots of stories that were told about her and memories that were there, um, I, I'm just thankful she's gone. I mean, uh, God has just blessed her and given a great legacy to our family uh, through Clarine. And, uh, but I know that she's way happier right now than she was a week ago today. And uh, I thank God for that. And, and that's just something that God gives us. In fact, um, let's just take a moment right now. I, I know that we don't usually do this much in churches anymore, but... Uh, what are you thankful for right now? You just What I'll, I'll ask you to do is just stand up and say real short, what are you thankful for right now? Anybody, just... My relationship right now with God. Okay. My new apartment, so I can get closer to my husband. Okay, a new apartment, okay. Christian friends. Okay, Christian friends. All your grandchildren. Great. I create some really specific things for my kids that God answered above and beyond my expectations. Okay. Answer to specific prayers above and beyond expectations. Great. Thanks. Anybody else? A loving church family for me this past year. Okay. Anybody else? <coughs> This is kind of hard, isn't it, sometimes? Uh, you know, it's real easy to go negative, though, isn't it? 
Uh, but sometimes when we're, when we're looking at what are we really thankful for, uh, I just want you to, uh, to sit down and as you're doing your self-examination part, uh, and you have your outline here in your bulletin, just as you get to the Thanksgiving part, just write down things. Write down things that you're thankful for, uh, that God's done in your life or, or what you're thankful for in your, your job or what you're thankful for in your family and those sorts of things. There's, there's real value in writing things down. I know that uh, a lot of times as we're working with families who come in to smile again and they're grieving, one of the things we encourage them to do, write down things that you're going through. Write down your emotions and some of those struggles and some of the victories that you're having in those moments because it's great to be able to look back at those uh, weeks later or a month later or even at the end of 2016 now to be able to look back at week one in 2016 and say, wow, look at that. How has that changed uh, in this year? So give thanks. The third thing I want to look at in the O is open your heart to God. Open your heart to God. The Bible tells us that uh, over and over and over again that when God looks down from heaven and when he examines us, he's focused on one thing, and that's our heart. That's our heart. That center of our being that controls our actions, uh, our emotions, uh, how we make decisions, how we live our lives out loud, uh, as I've mentioned, kind of that uh, concept that I've been sharing with you frequently here, actions always follow our belief system. If you say you believe something, then you're going to act in certain ways. So God is looking at our hearts. That's driven by our hearts. In the early chapters of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament, uh, we see the rise of their first king in Israel, and uh, his name was Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, uh, the first part of uh, the ninth verse, we read this. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. The New Living Translation says it this way, God gave Saul a new heart. And uh, this is a moment in time where Samuel is uh, being sent basically to anoint a new king for Israel. And uh, as Saul is leaving in that moment, it says God gives him a new heart. And uh, if you read the passage on and following that, you see that uh, for a very long time, uh, he even uh, prophesies and, and has some incredible gifts in his life. Now... What we know about Saul, though, to begin with, was he was maybe one of those most unlikely candidates to become the king of Israel. Uh, In fact, as they're deciding who should be the king, uh, they're kind of drawing lots by uh, family and by tribe and by clan, and and, uh, the lot falls finally to Saul. He's a young man, and when the lot falls to him, where is he? When they they finally come down, Saul's the guy. Where is he? Hiding with the luggage is what the Bible tells us. He's hiding in the baggage compartment, basically, uh, uh, of his clan's get-together. As they've all come together, he, he doesn't want to be the king. Okay, he's hiding out. Now, one of the distinguishing things about Saul, of course, that we remember primarily from the David and Goliath moment is, what do we know about Saul's stature? He was really tall. He was head and shoulders above all of the rest of the people. So so for me, that's an even funnier moment for me. Here's this giant of a guy hiding, hiding in the baggage, you know, so no one will know where he's at. How does that change? How, how can God use a guy like that? Well, he looks at his heart, and he changes his heart. And Saul begins uh, to take his reign. Now, one of the great things about Saul is uh, for a very long time, uh, he was a, a good king, uh, was very effective as a, as a warrior and leading people into battle and his uh, people into battle. Uh, but as, as time begins to go on, the Bible tells us his heart begins to change. His heart begins to turn. 
And instead of following everything that God had told him, instead of praying for decisions, he decides to make his own decisions. Instead of waiting for Samuel to sacrifice before they go into battle, uh, Samuel is delayed for some reason, and Saul gets very nervous, and so he does his own sacrificing. And a lot of things begin to add up over and over in time, and his heart begins to change. And uh, God begins to look then for a replacement for him because uh, even though God has given him a new heart, as his heart begins to change, and I think we should understand as our heart begins to be hardened, uh, God will allow us sometimes to go down those trails. And so we see in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, God tells us this. As, as Samuel confronts Saul... Uh, for his foolishness, he says this, You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Uh, let me just, what's happened here, I'll put it into context. S Saul has gone into battle, and God had told him to destroy absolutely everything uh, as they go into this battle. All the, all the people, men, women, children, animals, everything is to be destroyed. Uh, by this army. And as Saul comes back, what comes back with him? Sheep. Sheep and goats uh, that they kept. And, and kind of the idea was, oh, look at there's some booty here. There's no reason to kill the animals. We should get something out of this for ourselves. And so they come back, but God had made it clear, I want everything to be destroyed. And so as he comes back, Samuel confronts Saul and says to him, why haven't you obeyed what God has told you to do? And Saul says what? I have. We went in, we, we took this, this place out, we destroyed everything, and then Samuel says what? Well, then what is that bleeding I hear behind you? What, what is that? Is that sheep that I hear behind you? And what does Saul say? He could think very quickly on his feet. Uh, yes. They are sheep. But they're not for me. We brought them back to sacrifice to God. Okay. And then Samuel says here, You've acted foolishly. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Who's the man with the new heart? course is David. David comes on the scene after this moment in time, and uh, uh, he is a man who has a heart after God. Now, what do we know about David? Well, we know that he was a great warrior, too. He was a great king. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He was a liar. Uh, and, and I don't pretend to understand all of these things about him that were different from Saul, but the Bible tells us that his heart uh, is moving and has moved toward God, and God sees that in David. And he also sees when it comes to, to Saul that his heart is rapidly moving away. So we need to open our hearts to God. Well, how, how do we do that today? Uh, I guess uh, probably what you're going to find is uh, you're going to find that as you do self-examination, isn't it? As we begin to do self-examination in our, in our lives, uh, we begin to see, what, what is it that God wants for me? How, how, how could I be used more for him? How could I make a commitment to him? Uh, some of you uh, here today maybe have never made that commitment to Jesus Christ. Uh, you're just light years away, uh, as it were, from God. Your, your heart isn't there at all for him. You're, you're just far away. Well, God wants you, as, as you're looking at that, open your heart to him. 
Uh, sometimes as we meet people, we've had uh, uh, atheists who have come to Smile Again Ministries, and uh, as we've been working with them and the death of their children, uh, uh, we've uh, obviously gotten onto the God factor sooner or later as we talk to them. And uh, one of the challenges that we give to them is simply this. Open your heart to God. You don't believe that he's there, but uh, we know that he's there. And so we want to challenge you to do this. Just get into the Bible, begin to read it, and just give God a chance. You know what I know? If you give God a chance, he'll come through that door. He does every time. And that makes the work for me a lot easier because I don't have to persuade them. It's God's responsibility to persuade them. But God's looking for what? A heart that's open. A heart that's open. And so that's what he's looking for you uh, today. Some of you are very busy today. You know, God's been uh, trying to get into your heart maybe a little bit, and he's been showing you uh, that uh, he, you know, this is an area, that's an area here that I really want to change in your heart and in your life, but you've been so busy, and uh, God's just calling out to you what? You need to open your heart to me today. You need to hear what I'm having to say. If you hear me talking to you, then you need to respond. You need to respond. Uh, we just need you to open your heart. Is the church seeing your spiritual gifts being used uh, in the church family here? Uh, uh, have you cracked open your Bible this week? How about this month? Well, it's early in the month. How about last year? Uh, one of the things that I always challenge people usually to do this last week in, in the new year, the first week in the, the new year, is this. If you've never read the Bible all the way through, read the Bible this year all the way through. I'm surprised sometimes as I talk to uh, believers who have been followers of Christ for years and years, and uh, I, I uh, ask them from time to time, have you ever read the Bible all the way through? I'm just stunned. No, I've never read it all the way through. This is our, this is our get ready for heaven thing here. This is, this is how we find out what God really wants in our life. This is how we find out what God is really like and who he's all about. And so if you've, if you've never read the Bible all the way through, uh, I just want to encourage you, open your heart to do that this year. Uh, I've had some people say, well, you know, I'm not a good reader. Well, good. There's an app for that. Okay? I don't even have to read the Bible. I can go to the Holy Bible app, and it's free, and I can push a button, and some guy reads the Scripture to me. Now, I have to admit, I wish he had a little more training in reading because sometimes it's just so monotone get excited here for a minute you know and then david took the rock and he slew goliath okay so that's why i like to read versus listen sometimes but uh there are great there are some guys that have done uh reading the scripture that have been really good and there's dra drama and, involved in it and stuff do it take time open your heart to give, that, give God that opportunity. Last thing, the letter P, passionate purpose in 2016. Passionate purpose. Uh, anybody who's around me very long uh, begins to hear me talking about living my life on purpose. Living my life on purpose. I don't think there's uh, any greater joy to be found as uh, we talk about self-examination and, and uh, all of these things, giving thanksgiving, opening our hearts, to understand that God's got a purpose for your life, uh, a special purpose for your specific life uh, to others around you. Uh, we, we're here to live out God's purposes in our lives and to live them out passionately. Uh, I, I think that... Um, there are some people, as I, as I sit down and talk to them about purpose in their lives and, and living it passionately, uh, sometimes I'll just get kind of a blank look back. What, what are you talking about? I, I'm just going through life. Isn't, don't you just go through life? 
uh, I want to encourage you, no, don't, don't just go through life. Be passionate about what you're doing. Uh, did you notice, uh, as, as I ha- highlight this, I, I want that passion to be highlighted there because passion carries the idea of really, really pouring yourself into it. How many of you have seen commercials now for uh, the Olympics this summer? Uh, they're starting to run now uh, rampantly, and of course, I think it's NBC that's going to do them. So if you watch NBC at all, uh, you're going to see their commercials because they love what they're going to be doing. One of the things I know in these next several months is we're going to begin to hear and when the Olympics come finally this summer, they're going to highlight different athletes. And you know what I'm going to find out about those athletes? If they're great at swimming... Uh, they're going to tell me that they're in the pool every single day, hour after hour after hour. In fact, when you meet them, all you can smell is chlorine. Okay? And they're doing that for what? To win a gold medal. And some of them are going to win by less than a hundredth of a second by touching that wall. And when they do that, we'll all go, hooray! And we'll look at them as gods. Because that's what we do. But they're not God at all. But they are what? They're passionate. Nobody wins a gold uh, medal in the Olympics without being passionate. They pay total dedication to this. And that's what I'm talking about in your life. What are you absolutely passionate about today? What do you hope to be passionate about uh, this, this year as we come into the new year? When we look at the New Testament, we see men and women who are passionate people, don't we? Uh, we look at Peter, and we look at Paul, we look at James, we look at John, we look at uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and uh, lots of Dorcas and, and different uh, individuals in the New Testament, and we look at them and we go, wow, these are, these are like super, 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 okay? And usually they're super Why? Because when we look at them and maybe compare them to me, we see what? A passion difference. It just seems like their whole life is about Jesus Christ. Their whole life is about their relationship with God. Their their whole life is centered around their faith. Do you know what I know about Peter and James and John and Andrew and the other apostles and Paul and Barnabas and Aquila and Priscilla and Dorcas and you name it, Cornelius? You know what I know about them? They're just people, just ordinary people. In fact, Peter and James and John and Andrew are what? Four fishermen that had a business together until they met Christ. And he calls him one day and says, hey, why don't you leave the fishing behind and come fish for men? I'll show you how to do that. And they do. Leave everything behind. What is that? That's passion. That's passion. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says this, but seek first, and this was read earlier, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. All of these things. What do you think is the passionate word in this verse? It's seeking. It's seeking, okay? Seekers are hunters. These are people who look for something until they find it, okay? They're passionate about it. And in this verse, God is saying what? Seek first his kingdom and all of these things. And if we put it into context, what were all of the things that he's talking about here? clothes, uh, our jobs, uh, how we're going through life, all of these sorts of things. All of these things, God says, if you seek my kingdom first, don't worry about this other stuff. 
because that gets added on as well. Okay? It gets added on as well. The word picture that God gives us here, I think, in Matthew chapter 6 is as we're seeking this passionate, we've just got to have it. Uh, it just doesn't happen accidentally. Uh, when I listen to uh, some pastors quote scripture, now, memorization is really hard for me. I don't, is it hard for anybody else? It's, it's hard for me. And so when I hear people who really uh, can quote scripture, um, Pastor Lauren Saulfrank, who's the pastor in the Alliance Church in Duluth, uh, he, he knows, oh, every time he talks, he's throwing out this verse, you know, and, and he'll even tell you where it is. Just, it's like, wow, you know. And, uh, and so we've talked a little bit, and, and uh, I interned in that church, and, and <laughs> uh, poor Lauren, I'll, I'll share this, though. Uh, we popped back in after about three months just to surprise everyone. And Lauren and I are very good friends. And uh, when he saw me, I knew right away, oh, I should have called. Because he panicked. You know what he was concerned about? That he might preach like me and not like him. And so he got all done with this message, and he had been, I could tell he'd been flustered during the message, but he just quoted scripture after scripture after scripture. And when he was all done, and uh, he came back, and his, his head was down a little bit, and I said, Lauren, a home run today. I said, how have you come up with all this scripture? Man, it's just awesome. And then he lit up, and he said, well, I memorize. You know what he was telling me? I'm passionate about hiding God's word in my heart. I'm not. I'm not as passionate as he is. Otherwise, I would what? Have the same thing, okay? That's what I'm talking about. I, I, I want you to understand that uh, pastors aren't superhuman either. You know, we, we struggle in those areas too. We tell you to memorize. Uh, sometimes it's hard for us. It's hard for me to memorize. But uh, I still try to memorize. Uh, different passages of Scripture. Now, can I ask you uh, this morning, how's your seeking going? Where, where's your passion level today as, you, as you're heading into 2016? Uh, and that really brings me back to my opening concern about time. How are you using it? How are you using your time? How are you spending your money? How are you using your spiritual gifts uh, we live in a society that is racing, just simply racing from place to place. Uh, in fact, yesterday I was talking with uh, one of my um, niece's husbands uh, after the funeral, and uh, he, he was saying, you know, Christmas has come and gone now. New Year's has come and gone. I just hate January and February until we get into March. I said, why? There's just nothing there's nothing to anticipate. Wow. Nothing to anticipate. Okay, what, what he's really saying is, I love the race. And don't we all? We kind of get pumped, you know, as those Christmas lights go up and holiday season is coming. And, boom, and boy, people are actually nice to you in the store. And, Oh, this year they were all saying Merry Christmas, and oh, there must be money involved then. And they're, oh, come see me. And, and now it's January 3rd, and they say, please don't come back. Stop returning the gifts you got at Christmas that you didn't like. We, we hate when you do that. Service, thank you. We live in a, a society like that, don't we? We're just driven by that. We have more things to do than ever before. We, we have more convenience items than ever before. Like I said, I don't, I don't even have to set my alarm. Do you know that? I just have to push a button and say, Siri, get me up at 630 tomorrow. And I'll release the button and she'll say, okay. And she does. The next morning at 6.30, Siri is there. Dun, 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 dun. 
Oh, the force is with me again for another day. Okay? Chances are some of you have literally spent hours between the last time I saw you two weeks ago, just before Christmas and now, programming TVs, uh, all sorts of gadgets that we get for Christmas, maybe a new uh, iPhone, maybe it's a new pad, maybe it's a new computer, whatever. We can spend hours and hours and hours doing that and not even think about it. I want you to think about it. Now look up here for a minute, and I want you to hear what I'm going to say. It's going to come up on the screen. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. That's a hard thing for us to understand in our culture today. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. And usually we just do things because we can because uh, it just happens. And uh, I want to encourage you to look at the opportunities that you have this year and say to yourself, should I do this this year? Should I continue to do what I did in 2015 this year too? And if not, then change. Make a change. If you want to live a passionate life in 2016, chances are some of the things you've done in 2015 are going to have to change and maybe even be left behind. So, what are you going to do to stop this year? I want to encourage you to look at all of these, all of these areas. Let me close with this verse that uh, Jesus shared with his disciples. It's something that we just need to be reminded of, and let's read it together when it comes up uh, here from uh, Mark chapter 8, 36. Let's read it together. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? What good is that? So I just want to encourage you, examine yourself this morning, open your hearts, give thanks to God, and then finally be passionate about living your life this year in 2016. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word again, and I thank you that you do give us these opportunities every 365 days to just stop to uh, examine our hearts and to, to give you thanks for all that you've given us in 2015. God, I just thank you. It's been an, an abundant year for Judy and me and for our family, for ourselves personally. I thank you, Lord, for that. I thank you, Lord, that uh, you've given uh, just opportunities to change my heart, too. Thank you, Lord, for this broken relationship that's been restored and, and, God, just areas in my life where you've just opened my heart to new things. Thanks, Lord, for that. And I thank you, Lord, for the passion you've given me to love you. And, Lord, that, that's not even from me. That's from you. E even that, even my passion comes from you. Lord, I pray for uh, my brothers and sisters here in Christ. Lord, that you'll just come alongside of each one of us. And, and I hope that this week, Lord, we'll all be able to stop for that moment, do all these things. And then, Lord, as we continue our, our journey through 2016, to live the life on purpose that you've called us to live, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.
go today, let us all raise a song in our hearts to bless his heart for all that he has done for us. 